Well, I think I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, I'll just keep my eye on the participants here and let folks in if we have some uh, other latecomers. Uh, it gives me great pleasure today to introduce uh, Jeff Morris, who's down in Texas at Texas A&M in College Stations. Right. Yeah, College Station, remember that correctly. And he's got a very interesting topic to talk to us about songs and sandwiches. Student vocabulary reveals how everyday tools manipulate artistic thought. So uh, I'll turn things over to him and uh, let him take it from here. Okay, thanks. And I, I prepared uh, my my presentation as a uh, as a video, so I'll just go ahead and uh, begin that. And uh, it has uh, captions as well, so it should be uh, more immune to uh, unpredictable aspects of the network. Let's see. There we go. Hello, I'm Jeff Morris, professor at Texas A&M University. I'd like to share an observation from my classroom experience that sheds light on how seemingly neutral computer applications have an unnoticed influence on our aesthetics and creativity. Since my university level courses on technology-based music often attract students with little background in classical music, I routinely encounter teachable moments when I gently correct a student and take time to explain to the class that a given piece of music should not be referred to as a song, they just don't know what else to call a piece of music. This innocent label betrays a significant cultural barrier to receiving new forms of musical expression. An unfamiliar work of abstract music is at a significant disadvantage when it reaches uninitiated listeners. If every piece of audio content is a song, and if a given composition lacks song-like features, then that would make it a bad song, and therefore it wouldn't be worth study or appreciation. Now, it's true we encounter a lot of actual songs in life for good reasons, such as in elementary school, celebrating holidays, and in formal ceremonies. In commercial advertisements, using a song just makes for effective communication design. We'll talk about these things in a bit, but there's one other influencing factor that seems to go unnoticed, and it's important that we don't let things like this slip past us. The many software applications we use to play and stream audio content have used the word song to describe any of its content, musical or not. These are ubiquitous software applications, including Apple Music, iTunes, Windows Groove Music, and streaming services like Spotify and even iHeartRadio, whose content is heavy in spoken word podcasts. Now, more recently, some applications have found ways to avoid labeling content, and if they can tell it's a podcast, then they might have started using the term episode instead. But you can still find things wrongfully called songs in places, and it's been this way for decades. It's easy to imagine how this came about. A software developer wanted to make an application that plays music files. There needs to be some way to store and display the title of the music being played. So a data field or a column gets labeled as song title. No one notices or cares enough at the time to ask, what do we do about this string quartet? And then before you know it, people use it to store and play sound recordings of things other than music, such as stand-up comedy routines, lectures and sermons. And as the software adds features, it lets you add videos and text files too. U2's liner notes for the album Songs of Innocence were included in iTunes as a PDF file alongside the actual songs on the album. And before you know it, the word song almost starts to mean thing, as in the thing that is currently being played by the software that was originally designed to play songs. My students and the rest of our culture have been immersed in this way of slinging content around for decades. And so I don't blame them. However, this realization did make me notice some important things that we're missing out on as a result. So what makes something appropriate to call a song? At this point, I ask my students to pause and think of a verb that humans do that's like the word song. It comes from the same verb to sing. So at its heart, something called a song should be sung or at least singable as in instrumental songs. So what makes music singable? I like to take my time with this, seeing what aspects I can guide students to notice, 
But first, a singable tune must be made of pitched sounds. Remember, I'm teaching electronic music, and we're listening to Stockhausen, so limiting ourselves to pitched sounds isn't an obvious choice. And it rules out a lot of creative possibilities right from the start. To be... Those pitched sounds need to be in a certain pitch range, much more limited than what a piano can play, for example, and whether the tune is set in the treble end or the bass end of the human singable pitches, it needs to stay there, limiting the pitch range even further, often to little more than one octave. What else? Usually my students will get to an observation like, it can't be all over the place. We can unpack a few things from this. First, having a lot of leaps makes a melody harder to follow. Bach and Bacharach have pulled it off, and it doesn't make them bad songs, but it does make them more difficult to sing, which might make them bad song choices for a public sing-along. We'll come back to that later. So anyway, a melody usually needs to be mostly conjunct without a lot of leaps in pitch. A singable tune also shouldn't be all over the place in time. It should be constantly present in order to earn its place in the foreground of our attention. More on that later. Although also, in order to suit human physiology well, it should have occasional brief pauses when it's time to breathe, or when a musical idea has come to a close. Often both happen at the same time. Finally, a singable tune can't be all over the place in terms of ideas. It needs to be coherent, repeating or at least evolving just a few musical ideas in a straightforward and organized way, or else it'll shake listeners loose. A sensible metric organization helps too. A short, repeating metric hierarchy helps us catch on to the structure easily, and danceable beats help as well not too fast or too slow for our bodies to move to, and preferably grouped in multiples of two to match our feet. So what makes something worth calling a song? Can we state it briefly? In short, I like to borrow a term from science and say that a song is optimized for the human scale, including physiological matters like singable pitch range and danceable beats, as well as cognitive matters like pattern recognition and memory. So, a song is maximally accessible for the generalized human scale. This is the crux of the issue when students conceive a division between music they have to learn in school and music they choose to play for themselves, which they might even refer to as real music or good music informally. In a way, the effectiveness of a song in serving goals outside of music has backfired against the learning of music itself. Music is all around us, but most of it is serving goals outside of music rather than challenging us, giving us opportunities to grow as music makers and music listeners. Music is a form of human expression, though, and we are missing out on too much of it if we're discounting music that isn't song-like. A song isn't the only kind of music, just like a sandwich isn't the only kind of food. Close your eyes and imagine this sandwich. Here's the first bite. Hmm. Banana? That's a surprise, but it could work in a sandwich. Another bite. Chocolate. Okay, this is going to be a very sweet sandwich, but I've heard of that before. But why is this sandwich cold? Like, ice cold? This sandwich isn't turning out well. And why do I have to eat it with a spoon? This is a terrible sandwich! You see what I did there. A banana split, an ice cream sundae, is a terrible sandwich, just like Stockhausen's Kontakte is a bad song. Students are taken aback when I declare that it's a bad song, but you see what I mean. This doesn't mean it's bad music. It's only bad if you look for song-like properties. Carlines wasn't in it for the likes and subscribes. Here's another example for you, quickly. Close your eyes and take a bite. This one's meaty. That's promising. And it's a hot sandwich. Here's some juicy tomato flavor. Nice. And some cheese. All right. But the bread, it's really wet and soggy and stringy. And why is it wrapped around a fork? Even though spaghetti and meatballs, 
pizza, desserts, and so on can be appreciated as much as a sandwich, the song dominates our cultural attention and value. However unintentionally, unnecessarily, and unfortunately, leaving most of our culture to miss out on music's full expressive potential. So, a song isn't the only kind of music, just like a sandwich isn't the only kind of food. I've discovered with my students that songs and sandwiches have a lot in common. For example, they both stick to well-established and familiar structures. They both rely heavily on a set of ingredients that are almost always available. Most kitchens will contain bread, protein, and condiments, as most musicians will have access to a keyboard, guitar, or drums. And they're both easy to take in while doing other things, like driving, studying, or socializing. Also important, this is not a statement about quality. It is possible for some songs and sandwiches to provide profound experiences and justify extreme prices or waiting in long lines. Both a brilliant song and a brilliant sandwich could be a life-changing experience or make someone's career. In my classes, I usually have to settle for encouraging students to refer to music that is not song-like as a piece, a work, or perhaps a composition if it was composed or improvisation or performance, if it would be more appropriate, or simply as the music. We're at a loss for useful terms unless we refer to more specific aspects, as in improvisation or performance, or specific genre names. Terms like aria, tone poem, fugue, processional, and divertimento reveal the many ways that music has integrated into culture. Using genre labels to acknowledge and discuss historical cultural function facilitates reflection on the many ways in which music is integrated into our current culture. Even music that we could justly call songs could more precisely be described as ballads in the storytelling sense, hymns, dances, divertimenti, overtures, fanfares, and so on, which can promote awareness of our own culture. Rediscovery of applicable terms from historical music makes our cultural heritage more accessible, and it also allows us to see where new terms are truly needed, where music enters our lives in yet new ways. Software design plays a role here, too. Look in the genre menu in any music playing or streaming software, and you'll see genres like classical, country, electronic, and Latin American. But all of these kinds of music have their own approaches to dance music, love songs, ballads as in the storytelling songs, and so on. Most of our music software uses the term genre when it should use the term style. The term genre is related to genus, as in genus and species. So you could say each different genre is like a different animal. I encourage students to consider genre by thinking about the shape of the musical situation and what musical properties suit it best. Social dance music is for people to socialize, not to focus on the music, so successful dance music has a continuous steady beat, a lot of repetition, and few if any words, maybe just enough to set the mood like a hype man or a party DJ. This is so the lyrics don't interfere with your talking with friends. This is generally true for dance music as a genre, whether you're playing it with violins, fiddles, violinists, or synth strings. Those are stylistic choices with their own connections to culture. In contrast to dance music, a ballad, the storytelling song, would reward sitting still and paying attention to the words all the way through. And it can afford some rhythmic irregularities to serve the text, and some bursts or pauses for dramatic effect. Our students and other listeners who only know songs and not other kinds of music are missing out in big ways regarding our past, present, and future. What if we all recognized that most music we hear in everyday life would best be called a divertimento, just an amusing background or decoration, rather than being the only worthwhile kind of music and the only way to take it in? What if we all recognized that it wasn't just any old songs, but rather processionals that accompany some of life's biggest moments, like graduations, weddings, and funerals? What if we all recognized that different cultures bring their own styles to music, 
but that many of them actually share the same genres, using music with common properties suited to dance, worship, and contemplation. An awareness of style and genre as two separate things, as well as the musical properties that support each, keeps listeners in touch with the cultural heritage and societal values that matter most in each musical situation, and they discover how rich the potential of music is to express and support those values in many ways. In the present moment, listeners coming to classical music who are only prepared to hear songs are likely to miss what substance the composition has to offer. Imagine a friend brings you to a football game and you know nothing about it. You've never heard of it. You sit in the stadium seat and you look where? Straight ahead, like you do in any seat. And what do you see? Just more people like you. Well, that's pointless. Football is worthless. It's a waste of time. That's because you don't know where to look, and you're missing all the action. There's a series of revelations to be had for those who invest patience and attention. Once our budding football fans learn to watch the field rather than look straight ahead, they might go through successive realizations like, well, it's just a bunch of people running around on this green square. And then, well, it's just two groups of people running in opposite directions. At some point, they will realize, oh, there's a ball. And each group tries to move the ball in opposite directions. Eventually, they may be able to appreciate how skillfully players are able to move the ball past their opponents. Now they're able to get something out of the experience, to take something away from it. To serve the future, we can encourage our students and listeners to use these words more carefully, so the software developers among them can recognize how seemingly simple design decisions can unintentionally shape culture in this way, and so the creators among them can be more aware of how their tools unintentionally influence their thought processes. We owe it to our students, to ourselves, to each other, and to our fellow humans to make this point, or at least to bring listeners closer to a point where they can start to question their assumptions. After all, if all you do is make what people can only see as being bad songs, then what good is that to anyone? Well, that's the prepared presentation. Uh, thank you all for staying staying with me. I'm uh, excited to share this with you, and I'm curious to see uh, if there are any uh, uh, comments to uh, further this uh, discussion. Well, I find myself doing the same thing that you mentioned in the in the video, uh, correcting people when they say song, but then struggling for words to come up quickly with some some word and not say song myself. Yeah, this is uh, this realization for for me is or this way of presenting it has come off uh, come uh, up over you know, several iterations. And uh, well, uh, luck, I guess, and having the right kinds of questions, I, I think, for my students, uh, leading me to, I think, hopefully, I'm on to a, a productive way to approach it. I uh, I wanted to to bring up uh, the the term post genre world. I, I think that's been floating around a lot, um, and um, it's an, it's been an interesting one for me to think about because in, in in many ways I think it's true that we live in this post genre world or um, it, at times we may like the idea of aspiring to it but then I, I think there's also kind of a reality in which I mean there there are advantages to to labels as well so I I can see many different angles to using or thinking about the idea of a post genre world I was wondering what your thoughts on that might be. Um, yeah, I haven't I haven't seen many uh, d discussions using that term. I, if, at first, I'm I'm curious if uh, it's also conflating genre and style, and uh, so yeah, post 
you know, and making it difficult to talk about style. You know, I, I, these days I'm teaching the history of electronic music course. And so I get a lot of um, uh, uh, people who are only think that it means uh, dance music, electronic dance music. And uh, the, the, the definitions that I find, it, it took me a long time to figure out, you know, the, it, it, a, a useful way to determine the difference between techno and house and things like that. And all the, all the definitions, um, there are so many encyclopedias of these things, and they all go right to tempo and BPM. And, you know, this is 80 to 100, and this one's 90 to 110. And I, that's, the, and it really, I think those are more useful for creators. You know, if you're going to start making something that's deep house, then I'll use these settings and then start to go, and that gives you a safer framework. But it doesn't help people really talk about it. And, yeah, we need labels in order to talk about it, but also... Um, uh, the uh, the uh, Nick Collins, the author of the textbook we use, points out nicely how um, some of these terms came up, especially um, in uh, electronic dance music, came up because from journalists or artists who just wanted to have something to say about themselves uniquely, and so they came. They maybe don't deserve having those terms, but someone, so you know, to to an extent, their words for words' sake. Um, but uh, and you know, blurring of styles is is great, and will always you know that I, I imagine that's going to uh, evolve just like dictionaries do uh, in in the district descriptive sense and the easiest way that it makes it, that it makes sense to make whatever points we're making. Um, if genre means genre, if the genre and post genre you know really does mean genre, that kind of makes me sad. Um, it, it, I, I might wonder if that's pointing to um, a broad commodification of music. Let's put on some music like, you know, let's let's have something to drink uh, and we'll pick it up off the shelf and it doesn't matter which one it is. They're all the same, they're all wet, they'll all basically, and it's just a matter of taste. And uh, that commodification is is dangerous, I think, for, you know, for all of us, the musicians first, um, but then for culture, because, uh, you know, this, this, this pulling this on this thread and realizing the different ways that we've worked in music and can appreciate how mu different aspects of music serves different parts of our lives, helps us realize that those parts of our lives are important. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, uh, to, to see that all kind of collapsed into one kind of music that's just in a bottle and you get the green label or the red label and it's, commod uh, it's a commodity, uh, is, it leads to um, us losing touch of all those things. And uh, that's that makes me sad for for all of culture. I mean, might represent a, a setback or at least a while before we make any kind of ad other advance culturally. <laughs> and uh, and just to follow up, I'm glad you brought up the distinction between genre and style because I think when I've heard that term post genre used, it really seems to be kind of a misuse of <laughs> of the word genre. That it seems to be referring to style. And uh, I wonder if it's one of those definitions that because of the very things you're talking about that you know there's this massive use throughout um the software programs or or just public uh, discourse uh, these days that it makes me wonder if, if our definition of that will will change or or what but uh, i'm glad you brought that up too yeah i have to wonder if if it's almost become being used kind of as a euphemism for style like it's it's french and so, you know, it sounds a little bit more serious, a little bigger, or maybe style sounds like, well, your it sounds too personal, you know, and your, your style is, you know, well, I like shirts, but not, not white ones. And so that's your style. And we'll talk about something bigger, the genre of, um, but uh, yeah, that's, um, if anything, we're in an awkward stage in the development uh, you know, of those terms, that's probably, you know, much more slower, slowly developing. And uh, we don't want the good stuff to be lost in the process. <laughs> I said one one final um, kind of uh, reflection on, and as far as terminology, uh, another thing that we're hearing much more of is this distinction between sonic art, uh, like a sonic artist versus a composer uh, or a songwriter, you know, performer, musician, whatever. Um, sonic art versus music. Wondered if if you have ever integrated that, um, you know, <laughs> into your into your uh, talks with your students or anyone else. Yeah, that's a different slideshow. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, yeah, I, um, and this is be, and this is brought on by the textbook we we use by by Nick Collins. It's just a little bit out of reach, but yeah, there's a chapter on uh, he calls he calls the chapter sound art, and uh, I, I share with my students. Um, I 
I use the term sound art sometimes for myself when I don't feel like explaining, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't feel like explaining things further. It has this distance from music that, um, you know, somehow, somehow artistic, somehow creative with sound. And then we, you know, you, we don't have to challenge your views on what music should be. And then that's okay. But, I, you know, personally, I feel a little dirty about that because really, I, as I see it, uh, sound art is a term that really belongs to um, people who, tra who are trained in visual arts primarily. And um, I, I know many people who are visual artists and then they, they end up working in sculpture and they end up working in painting and then they end up using sound as their medium sometimes. And they're, they're approaching it as, as visual artists, even while at the same time I and you know, many uh, composers working in electronic music have delved into video art as well as part of it. And we're uh, um, by and large thinking about the, the video, visual aspects as composers. And so, you know, even though we're, we're both, you know, overlapping so heavily. Uh, um, so, yeah, the, there's those terms uh, I, I bring into the conversation when we discuss with students that um, uh, John Cage, you know, considered it all music. We, didn't, we don't need a term like sound art. Uh, and if it, once you start to realize that, that line of reasoning, you start to see, well, it's just pretentious <laughs> to try to add a label to, to things. Um, but um, Bill Fontana, who's, who studied with Cage, likes the term sound art, but he's, um, he focuses on the life of a sound after it's left the sound producing device. And so more about acoustics and how it resonates in the room. And so, okay, there is a separate thing. You know, once it was music when it was on the page and when it was in my valves or my bell, then it becomes sound. And yeah, so that's one way of framing it. Um, Trevor Wishart uses the term sonic art, and he, he kind of gave up basically on uh, trying to expand the definition of music to incorporate the odd kinds of sounds that come out of his mouth. Um, and so, okay, music is this smaller thing and sonic art is this bigger thing. And so, uh, yeah, th uh, there, there are all those different opinions. It, still, my best interpretation of it is sound art belongs to visual artists, but I, I don't it's fine to use if it moves the conversation along. <laughs> I, I see uh, Jeff Winslow uh, uh, submitted something in, in the chat um, and uh, maybe I should give voice, voice to it. Um, he says, I, I particularly appreciate the observation that a sandwich can be in effect a work of art worth a lot of respect and attention. Yeah, me too. Um, as, as a re reformed classical snob, it took me a long time to come come to that realization and even longer to realize or to learn how to talk about it without sounding critical. And that sandwich analogy is, is so good for that. Yeah, I, I've realized, um, you know, the, every time I brought it up with my students, we would find more and more parallels. And it is this kind of form follows function aspect, um, but uh, it, it becomes a, a rather entertaining discussion to have um, to, to realize these parallels between songs and sandwiches. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad uh, that resonated with you guys. Thanks, Jeff. I like, um, Jeff, I like your, your comment, your, your term reform, a classical snob. Yeah, I can relate to that. And, and then people say, well, what do you mean by classical music? That's not classical. That's like, you know, so then you get back to what is it style or genre you know it anyway language <laughs> that's why we're musicians right <laughs> yeah exactly i was just gonna my daughter bought when when words you miss or something language speaks or something i mean when language misses word music speaks mm. or words fail music speaks i had to read it yeah because i kind of say things like that. <laughs> I can remember music better than words. <laughs> and that's, that's important realization too. It's, a, it, it's different thought processes. And so we can get to different kinds of realizations using that. And yes. we're all capable of that. It's worth developing. Similarly, I, I'll share, the, there's that quote, um, maybe you've heard, um, uh, writing about music is like dancing about architecture. Yeah. <laughs> and I find that useful to my students too. So, you know, take time to think, how would you dance about architecture? Like, well, you kind of, you know, it's this way and that way. And then you feel, <laughs> you feel how it's, how at a loss you are. Uh, it turns out that's credited to Martin Mull, the, the actor and director. Um, 
I'm still kind of troubled by that, <laughs> but I, um, tracking that down, that's what I found. So thanks to him. Oh, and, um, Oh, and so Jeff shared a, a, a piece by Brahms, V Melody and Seat Es Mir. Is that, is that uh, uh, talking about that in the same topic, Jeff? Is that um, what? what? Yeah, words versus music. Yeah. Is that translated as uh, what, what music, what, what melodies show me? Something like that. How they enlighten me, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it, that, that's that's certainly an old, uh, well, you know, Pythagoras certainly thought it was important too. <laughs> Goes back. Well, thank you all for uh, for uh, you know, uh, 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 sharing in this and uh, advancing this uh, discussion. Hopefully it'll be uh, even more valuable to my students now that it's matured uh, even a bit more and uh, I hope uh, hope you can take some of this and and uh, use it in your own discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, Jeff. Appreciate your time and a very good presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh huh. Yes. I'm glad. And thanks for hosting. Okay. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>